All right, guys, thank you so much. Um, appreciate all of you joining us here today for our last scheduled um, leadership call. Appreciate all of you guys joining us today. We've got a great lineup and a great um, list of, of speakers for us today. So again, I appreciate you guys uh, joining in. Our um, leadership call series um, was scheduled here to wrap up here in April. Um, this is the, ordinarily the, the day that we would have our uh, emergency um, services and uh, first responders day as part of our program day. And then our graduation would be in a couple of weeks. So again, kind of a strange time for us as we've headed through the last several months together, we would actually be preparing now to, to wrap up our, our program year. But um, again, as, as things are right now, I am happy to announce that uh, our board of directors have been working very closely with a uh, healthcare team within uh, our board. And uh, we are looking forward to starting all full in-person programming beginning in August. So we're excited to get things back together um, with our uh, opening reception and then leadership retreat. We're working closely with um, a group of, of, again, healthcare professionals that will be working with us on each one of our venues and locations make sure that we had things set up properly and appropriately so that, uh, again, we, we provide everyone with a good, safe experience. We're excited about doing that and getting things kicked off, again, under normal circumstances or as normal as we can be then in August. Today's leadership call um, is called Preparing for Crisis, Personal and Professional. Today's um, moderator, the person that will be leading today's uh, call is Chief Skip Stevens. He is the Cottleville Fire Protection District and the chief of the Cottleville Fire Protection District. He's also on our vision board and uh, a member of the vision class of 2018, serves uh, on our board of directors as class representative from the class of 2018. And uh, again, Skip does a great job with us. Um, our speakers today, and I'm gonna let Skip do a be much better job of, of introing them. We have Tina Meyer, the founder of the Megan Meyer Foundation. Terry Portel, author, uh, author of the book, Facing Life Head On, and then Amy Shaw, president and CEO of, of Nine PBS. Before we get started, as we do on each one of our calls, I wanna run down it again, make sure that um, we recognize all of our main sponsors for the Visions uh, St. Charles County Leadership Program. Barnes Jewish St. Peter's Hospital and Progress West serves as our platinum and main sponsor of our program and program year. Compass Health Network serves as our gold sponsor this year. SSM Health, St. Joseph Hospital in St. Charles and Lake St. Louis is a silver sponsor. Mercy Hospitals is a silver sponsor. St. Luke's Hospital is a silver sponsor. Thrivent Financial just joined us as a silver sponsor last month. You know, Fallon Hoots baseball team um, has been our alumni sponsor last year, and I met with them um, late last week, and they re-upped and are going to be our alumni sponsor again this coming year, so we're excited to have them on board. Uh, they've got a lot of activities coming up, and uh, all of our current class participants will also be uh, eligible for a lot of things that they're offering to us again this year, so we're excited to have them back. Our chamber sponsors are the O'Fallon Chamber of Commerce and Industries, the Greater St. Charles County Chamber of Commerce, and the Chamber Cottaville Weldon Spring. They, um, uh, those three chambers serve as our main chamber sponsors and have been great, uh, great partners again with us, both serving on our board of directors as well as tremendous supporters and recruiters for the, uh, for the vision program. I'm going to go ahead and kick it back over then to uh, Skip. You said that you are able to share screen, Skip? Yes, sir. I believe so. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I'm going to let you have it. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to see everybody. Vision class of 2022, the longest class ever, thanks to COVID. Um, so today I'm very excited to bring to you three amazing guest speakers. The theme of today's leadership call, as you know, is crisis preparation. It's a little bit of a unique kind of uh, subject matter. It's not your average leadership um, subject, so it's which is going to set the stage for something really cool. Um, 
crisis, crisis preparation. Um, a fact of life is this, we will all face a crisis at some point in our lives. It's not a matter, in my opinion, it's not a matter of if someone's gonna face a crisis, but when. Uh, in, in crisis, you know, it's, it's got such a negative connotation to it, but perhaps, you know, going through those difficult times is a big part of the purpose of our lives. You know, maybe just maybe all of those difficulties and challenges and roadblocks and time periods of our lives when everything goes wrong, the crisis, crises, uh, maybe they, they serve a purpose in our lives to make us stronger, to, to make us wiser, to, to make us more faithful or just somehow more evolved as human beings, right? Um, one of my favorite sayings is that calm skies and smooth waters have never made a skilled sailor. And, you know, I, I think about that a lot during difficult times. Um, and something else that's, I think, very important to understand before we kind of get rolling with our guest speakers is that everyone's crisis is a little bit different, right? Everyone's crisis is a little bit, looks a little bit different. Not everybody has a big public or scandalous crisis. Um, not everybody's crisis involves the death of a loved one. Um, most of the time, a crisis is very personal to you. It's very quiet. Um, and what might be a crisis to me might be illogical or not make sense to somebody else, but it's a huge thing to me. Uh, and, and to varying degrees, we all have these crises. We have many crises, and then hopefully only once or twice in a lifetime we face a major crisis. So um, maybe, just maybe, those crises are, are supposed to propel us forward. Um, I don't have all of the answers, and I'm not an expert with crisis, but what I do know is we can all learn something from our guest speakers today in regards to crises. And uh, I'm not, we've got a, a program jam packed with amazing speakers. So I wanna get right to it. But before we get started with our first guest speaker, if you have questions, uh, type them in the chat box and I'll try to monitor and save those questions until the end. Each one of our speakers today is going to go about 20 or 25 minutes and then we'll have a few minutes for some question and answers. I'll try to kind of um, watch those questions and then we'll, we'll address those at, at the end. Um, and so with that said also just kind of be respectful to keep the chat box clear so that we can not lose questions. Okay. All right. My our first guest is Tina Meyer Merriweather. Is that right, Tina? It's just Tina Meyer. It's Tina it's, Meyer, okay. When I work, it's just Tina Meyer. It's okay. much easier than trying to add on that extra name at the end. I didn't want to get your name wrong. Our first guest is <laughs> Tina Meyer. She is the founder and executive director of the Megan Meyer Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. On October 16th, 2006, Tina's life was turned upside down when her daughter, Megan, took her own life. Tina worked closely with Senator Scott Rupp and former Governor Matt, Blunt, Matt Blunt's Internet Task Force for the state of Missouri to help pass Senate Bill 818, which went into law in 2008. And it's from this tragedy, tragedy that Tina travels across the country advocating the issues of Internet safety, along with Megan's story. The foundation strives to help one child at a time until bullying and cyberbullying are non-existent. Tina, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, do you have the slides or do you want me to? Okay. I have them and I am ready to share them. Are you? Okay. And you so, have to kind of navigate and just tell me what to do with next slide or take them out. It's, I mean, really, it's not a big, if you just want to be able to show a couple of the slides and then we can pop back on, it's fine while I'm talking. So is that fine? It's fine. Hey, Mark, <laughs> I was wrong. You're going to have to make me the host. <laughs> so um, I am grateful to be able to speak anytime um, about what we do in the community, about 
um, not just about Megan's story, but if there's any time a way that we can share what we've gone through and it can possibly help another person, then I am happy to do it. It's not that um, anybody who's gone through tragedies truly just enjoys speaking about the tragedy. It's more so knowing that what happened could possibly impact another person. That's always the hope, always the goal each and every time. Um, so I grew up in St. Charles um, my whole life, went to St. Charles West High School. I was not a very good student, um, struggled. I had, you know, like a lot of people, we have, because I think when you're looking at tragedy, you always want to look at how does one person get through it? And how does another person not get through it? How, how is that? Like, where am I going to be if it ever happens? And for me, I went through a lot of tragedy, um, but it was, I, I was loved and I had a house and I was fed. It was just that my father was sick with a brain tumor. My brother was sick with a brain tumor. And so there was a lot of things where my dad died when I was 15 and my brother eventually died. Um, and so you go through those things. I was a very scared, petrified, petrified of death, petrified of every single thing in this world. And sometimes when you go through certain tragedies or certain things, you find this inner strength that you never knew that you had. Like there's no way that you can predict that you're going to be this person. It doesn't ever seem like you're going to get to that point, but sometimes each one teaches you this lesson. And I think it's kind of what almost prepared me to be in the place that I was with Megan. Um, I was a mom with, uh, you know, a real estate license. I was happy, sold houses, had two beautiful girls, but Megan was the kid that struggled struggled with depression, um, attention deficit disorder, struggled fitting in, struggled friendship dynamics. Um, she was the kid that struggled in school. She was amazing, loving, funny, um, but she also never found this place that she truly fit in, that like group of friends where she really felt like that was the group. And she struggled all the way until um, from kindergarten, really, until uh, seventh grade. And we finally, it got to the point where it was so bad, we switched her to a different school. And it wasn't that the school was horrible. Sometimes there's only so much that schools and people can do when a child has gone through a school for years and all of the kids know what trigger things to do. They know what will get under their skin. They don't have to even say things sometimes. They can just mimic things or, you know, mouth something or walk by and shake their legs. To, you know, Megan's big thing was they always called her thunder thighs, you know, and all they'd have to do is walk by and shake their legs. Well, what's a school going to do? I mean, really, how are they going to pay attention to every single thing? So it just wasn't a good environment for her. And we switched her. Um, she then um, went to this private school, was doing really, really good. Um, but the whole world of social media came out, right? So she wanted to be a part of what everybody else was a part of. I was a very strict mom, very much of a helicopter mom, for sure. Um, and I monitored every single thing that she did. I had her passwords. She didn't even have her password account. I monitored everything. But um, unfortunately, it uh, everything was good on social media, but there was one night, October 15th, 2006, that these messages started turning horrible. And within 24 hours from messages that were just completely fine for six weeks, they all of a sudden turned. And um, unfortunately, Megan took her own life. Um, we later found out from all of these messages that were happening that, you know, it was a, a mom who lived down the street that was pretending to be a boy on MySpace. Um, and, you know, I think everybody deals with tragedy differently. And, and so when um, Skip was talking to me about how to prepare for this and how, you know, talking about the talking points were how to prepare in advance for a crisis, I, I was telling him like, I'm really struggling with this piece, thinking about, I don't know how I could ever prepare in advance for your child taking their own life. Like, how do I do that? How do how how am I going to convey this to get this across? 
to everybody. And when I think about it, um, first of all, in tragedy, when tragedy hits, there is no preparation that's going to prepare you for tragedy like that. You're going to go through every single stage of grief. You're going to go through the anger and the, the sadness and the guilt and all of the things that come with that. And that is a normal process. You have to go through those things. Um, but I think after these tragedies happen, I can look back now. And I think that mine was, I had such a hard time with the fact that one, how could my kid take her own life when she knew how much we loved her, when she had supports, we had counselors for her. She was going to counselors. She was getting the supports. We were doing medication to monitor it. She was in a, a really good place with her new school, new friends. She had all this whole world to look forward to. And still you can try to prepare and try to do all of those things and tragedy can still happen right there in front of you. And I think for me, um, I went through when it happened and found out the neighbors were involved. I went through the word rage doesn't even really come close to how I felt. It was rage. It was vengeance. It was anything and everything. All I could do is eat, sleep and breathe. How was I going to get them back to make them feel how they made me feel? I wanted those, that family to feel the pain of their child taking their last breath and being able to do nothing about it. That's what I wanted. And at the time, no one could tell me any different. Um, and then on top of that feeling, I had this absolutely god awful feeling of sadness thinking my kid took her own life over this joke, over this complete ridiculous joke. How, how can this happen possibly? And, you know, I think for me, the way I was able to get through it and it, getting through it was ugly um, not pretty. Um, it was family that did stand by my side through the good, bad, ugly. Um, even when I was not being very nice, not thinking clearly, you know, um, that stood with me and continued to remind me that no matter what you're going to do, you're not going to make those people understand your pain. You're not going to get Megan back. You have another daughter and it, they kept pounding it in my head. So that's all I could do was spiral that around and I would have to write in a journal. It's not going to bring Megan back. I have Allison. It's, I mean, almost like where I felt like I was going insane is, is the only way I can try to explain um, that period of time. It was absolute insanity. Um, and the grounding pieces were minute by minute, piece by piece. It was just a minute in between three hours of chaos. But there were the people, um, because through tragedy, not everybody sticks by your side. That means even family. That means even good friends that know you. Um, sometimes they're there for a moment. But then they step back and look at, well, why didn't they do A, B, C, or D? Or why are they behaving this way now or acting this way now? Um, they're not acting. They're not the same person they used to be. You're, well, you're absolutely right. I am not the same person I used to be. I will never be that same person I was before. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't be that person for you anymore. Um, some people have a really hard time being around that amount of grief. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. And they have a really rough time. And so they have to pull away and go back to their normal life because they can't handle it. And, but I will tell you, it was through the people that stood by me, the very few, and I will tell you very few, um, the majority of my friends walked. Um, and I'm not angry with them. Um, I just, I have to, in my head put, cause I couldn't handle more anger. I couldn't fill my head with any more anger. It was more uh, for me thinking, then you know what? They just couldn't handle it. So I don't have time to waste on them either. I don't have the, I don't have the energy. So if they need to move on, they need to move on. And those people that stood by me were my rock. Those people that just sat with me, 
that would come by, didn't ask, what do you need, would just come by and maybe help empty the trash or fold laundry or just sit there while I screamed or cried or didn't say a word. It was those people throughout tragedies that are just there. And don't say, what can I do for you? Because half the time you don't know what you need. You don't know what you need or how you need it, but that just actually come and sit with you in that worst period of time. Those are the people that helped me get through it. And for me, it was also my faith. Um, and whatever everybody's belief is, I have respect for that on all levels. For me personally, I had to pray to give me the strength to wake up the next day, to give me the strength to try to figure out how to be a mom now because I didn't know how to be a mom anymore. I didn't know. I felt like such a failure with Megan that I thought I have this 10 and a half year old child now. I, I, how am I supposed to even take care of her? I mean, I failed with the other one. I tried so hard for so many years with counseling and therapist and all of these things I did. And I was like, I don't even deserve to be a mom because I, I can, I'm not doing a good job. And so I, I struggled with that thinking I, I was petrified of losing her, that I was going to mess that one up too. And it's, um, God, even today talking about it, it still is that deep pain of feeling like a failure. Um, it's hard enough when other people put that on you, right? It's just that judgmental look, that little snide comment, those little things that they say, but it's the deep guilt that we put on ourselves of, are we doing good enough? Did we do enough for the person that we loved that through the tragedy? And um, even though it's been so many years later, it is still here with me every single day. Um, I started this foundation because I didn't know what to do with all of this. I didn't know how to survive or live. Um, and just acting like the situation that happened was just, okay, so your daughter took your own life. Let's go back and sell houses again. I didn't care about those people's houses. I, I, I used to love doing it. I didn't care if they bought a million dollar house and it had no roof, it, it didn't matter to me. Sorry, that's not my priority more, anymore. It's like, now it's, what can I do to help other families that are going through this, kids that are going through this? Because from hearing Megan, it's sharing Megan's story, the little bit in the beginning, I started getting calls and emails and people saying, I've gone through something like this, or I lost my child to suicide, or I've gone through that and realizing like this whole new world opened up of like, I didn't think about it before. I really didn't. And I started this foundation and our mission is to support and inspire actions to end bullying, cyberbullying, and suicide. And my goal from the very beginning was if I could share Megan's story, not in a scary, threatening way of, if you don't do this, you know, your child's going to take their own life or to kids, if you bully somebody else, they're going to take their own life. No, it's, it was never in that way. It was more in an educational way, a way to be able to get kids to connect to a story because I was the mom. They could connect to that and then talk to them about the way that we talk to each other and treat each other, how we are on social media, letting them know that they've had thoughts of self-harm or thoughts of suicide or attempts, that there is help that there are supports out there and that I know it's hard, but we can get through it if we work together. That was the whole purpose of it. And the whole goal was if I could do that and help one child throughout all of these years, then I can't put a price on that. And if all of these years later, I just helped one child and saved that life, then it's still worth it today. And that's how I go into every single school, every single event, Every single speaking thing that I do, if I can connect with one parent, one educator, one person that has a niece, a grandchild, somebody that maybe down the road they can help connect or some child, then we're making a difference because it's those little baby steps that make the ripples. Um, when I was asked, it said um, how to prepare. I think when we were talking about it, here would be my answer, how I could have prepared in, in some way. 
I would have tried not being scared of topics that I didn't understand. I would suicide. The word suicide was petrifying to me. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want anybody knowing about it because if anybody thought that my child had ever thought about it or talked about it, they were going to look at me as a bad parent, right? Like, my kids are perfect. My kids are on select soccer or they, they've made the honor roll or everybody puts their family up on a pedestal and acts like it's all great in this perfect little box. And then they whisper and talk. And unfortunately, mothers sometimes can be the harshest to other mothers, right? It's that belittling and talking about, whispering about like, well, I can't believe that there must be something going on in that house or that child. And I wished I would have not worried about what everybody else thought, not worried about what family thought, what other friends thought, because if people really knew me, they would have been there and supported me through knowing everything that I did for Megan. And I would have learned more about how to talk to Megan um, with the word suicide, because what would happen is if it was ever mentioned, my entire body would shake from the inside out. And I would immediately be on the phone to her pediatrician. I would be calling the doc, the psychiatrist, the counselor, like we need to get her in there. We need to talk. I don't know what's going on. And my whole goal was fix her, fix her, fix her. Like, that's it. Just, I will sell my house. I will give you anything and everything I've got. Just please make her a happy kid. And what I didn't understand was the whole bigger scope of things that um, counseling is important and, but talking to it, somebody who is struggling with suicide and telling them that I am scared, like I, I am scared, it does worry me, but I want to, I, I am here for you. And hearing you say you want to kill yourself is really hard for me as a parent, but I want you to know that I can handle it, that we are going to work together to find some supports and that you can come talk to me about it, even if I may be a little scared, but that's normal. It's because I love you instead of, okay, the second she said that I run into another room and I'm on the phone, you know, dialing all of these numbers because I'm panicking. And I think understanding mental health, um, I wish I would have learned the tool many years ago. It probably would have saved a million arguments even in your personal relationships um, about listening and validating. And that is strictly just when the child is coming home with all of the bullying and the things that Megan went through, I wished instead of being the parent that said, don't worry about those other kids, you know, you're perfect the way that you are, you know, ignore them or even I mean, I don't, I don't hide anything. I'm completely transparent. I was that mom that sometimes if the kids were horrible and mean, I would say, well, they're stupid too, right? You know what? If they're being this horrible and mean and they're going to not invite you to places, guess what? Don't invite them to the party, right? I, it was, I did that parent thing of when my kid is hurt, I'm hurt. So then I didn't understand how to be able to take that in and not react. I instead took it in and I was automatically trying to protect my kid. What I didn't realize I was doing was taking it now and projecting it out. And she saw me really kind of not in control. And so what would happen is instead of me taking that in and saying, man, Megan, I hear, her, you know, they're stomping behind you in the lunch line, calling you a fat cow and an elephant. I mean, that's got to be really hard. I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would handle it. And for you handling it, even for today and telling me about it, you know, I appreciate you trusting me enough to do that. And I want to help. It does upset me as your mom, but I want to help. What are, what are some ways, what are your thoughts on how to be able to work through this? What can we do together instead of those little jerks? <laughs> you know, how dare them do this to you? You know what? I'm going to the school because I go into that instant mode of either I want to protect her or I'm going to go to the school. And there was no in between. And I think if I would have, it's not to say the outcome would have been different, but listening to her, 
and then revalidating how she felt her feelings, not her behaviors or her actions, but just saying, that's got to be really tough. And, and, you know, and what can we do? How can I help you? Would have probably helped her come to me more versus what happened more so was she knew by the time she was in late elementary school, fourth and fifth grade and going into sixth grade, she knew as a mom how I was going to react when kids were mean to her. She knew I was either going to get upset. She knew that I was going to um, go to the school. She knew I was going to say, just ignore them. And so at, after that period of time, she did more of that almost protecting me as the mom. Um, I don't want mom upset. Mom's going to go to the school. And that's not the place that she should have been in. She should have been more in that place of where I could have handled it. The reality is no one teaches us this when we're parents, you know, no one teaches us this before you have a child, you know, here's what you need to do. If they have a broken bone, you take them to the hospital, right? But when it's a broken heart and they're struggling, we automatically go into protection mode. And so I think those are things that I really wish as far as a child, it would have been listening and validating. And I am not pushing anything because I don't watch anything that I ever do. I don't think, um, I, I think I watched the TED talk one time only because I do not like hearing my voice or seeing anything that I've done. But I do have a TED talk where it was listening and validating. And for parents, I talk to them about it all the time to try that piece and see the next time they're coming home upset or mad or whatever, if you try that listening and validating versus that, I told you you're not going there again. I told, why did I tell you you're not going? Because I said so, because I'm the parent. Instead of, you know, I understand you're upset with me and you wanna, you wanna go, but I'm not comfortable with that. So how can we work on something different? What are ways that we could work on maybe down the road, you're able to do A, B, C, or D, but not right now. And sometimes those calm conversations can be much better than the screaming matches that we have with our kids. So I don't want to take up more time because I know there's other phenomenal speakers. Um, I hope that maybe there was one little piece of something um, that came across and maybe connected with one of you, but I um, appreciate you having me here to be able to talk and if any of you ever have anything, um, our foundation is here in St. Charles. We don't charge anything. So if you ever know of somebody who's struggling or has a child who's struggling, we will listen, support, provide resources. And we also have counseling that is free of charge for children in St. Charles County um, under the ages of 19. And so if there's ever a need or you know of somebody, certainly you can refer them and we'll help in any way we can. But I really appreciate your time. I appreciate being invited and I will stay for a little bit. Um, I have another meeting at 4.15, but I'll stay if there's any questions in the meantime. So thank you so much. Tina, that was amazing. That was just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. We're gonna get you. the information about the foundation out to all of today's participants. Okay, wonderful. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Tina, go ahead and unmute and go ahead and ask your question. A lot Hi. of things coming across the, uh, the chat. Yeah, I have a question for you, Tina. Was there any legal repercussions for that family that did the bullying? So in the state of Missouri, we didn't have any laws. They looked at child endangerment, harassment, and stalking. Um, Jack Bannis uh, was the prosecuting attorney at the time, and he did not feel that there was enough there to be able to charge Lori Drew. Um, in the meantime, though, um, the US or the US attorney in Los Angeles, they heard about Megan's story. Because MySpace's headquarters were in Los Angeles, they had a federal grand jury indict Lori Drew. So Lori Drew did face uh, 20 years in prison on four different counts. We did go to the federal trial in Los Angeles in 2008, almost two years after Megan died. Um, it was a joke, honestly. Um, the reason that the judge allowed it to come through, go through and, and continue on because the ACLU, 
Many other organizations did like two and 300 page briefs because of freedom of speech. They were concerned that we would be, you know, that if we put anything out there and there were any laws that we would now be, you know, that first amendment right be pushing that to, pushing that away. He did allow, the judge allowed the case to move forward because he watched a law and order episode. This is absolutely no lie. It only happens in Los Angeles. A law and order episode pulled Megan's story from the headlines. And what they do is they kind of intertwine them with different stories. And they did that story. And the judge said on the bench that he could see how this could possibly be a problem. So he would go ahead and let the case move forward. That's how the case got moved forward. Um, the jury found her guilty on three of the charges, deadlocked on the fourth, and there were three misdemeanors, though. They were only now facing three years, in, or the mom was only facing three years in prison. But six months later, we went to sentencing after sentencing. He finally said, too many people lie on social media accounts. It would be unconstitutional to convict her. In the end, she was not convicted. But I don't regret a day that went by that we went through that whole process. Why? Because it was in the headlines. It made people understand more that these things are not okay. It did get laws changed in different states and it changed school policies. And so for that, even though it didn't come out legally the way I wanted, I then pushed forward this with this foundation. And again, it brought these topics to the forefront. So, yeah. Any other questions for Tina? I had I had some questions prepared, Tina, but you answered them all. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can talk. Like I cannot write a lick of anything. If you had asked me to write down what I just said, I would have three words on a page. I just have to verbally speak it as I go. <laughs> we do have a question from Amy Shaw. Okay. How, how is your younger daughter doing? Allison is 24. Um, she was 10 and a half at the time. Megan was always the kid that was into everything. Always wanted to know how everything worked, wanted to dismantle everything. She wanted to know about where babies came from way too early before I was prepared to talk about anything. She was just that kid where Allison was the innocent kid that wanted to be a real estate agent like me or a teacher or still play with babies at that age. You know, she was just that kid, um, she immediately developed panic and anxiety attacks. Um, we had to take her to, it was just, it was post-traumatic stress. She came in and saw Megan while her dad was giving her CPR. She, I mean, there's no way you can take those traumas away. Um, she also had two parents that weren't the same parents anymore. I mean, the second your child takes their last breath, you are instantly transformed into somebody different. So I wasn't the same mom and he wasn't the same dad. No one was the same. So she lost her sister and in essence lost the parents that she knew. She did go through counseling, but she, she struggled with insecurities, anxiety, being scared of the world um, for a long time. She finally, um, I would say within the past three years, finally, um, is figuring her place out. She's getting her, yes, she still lives at home with me. And honestly, I know it's not right, but I would be fine. She lived with me until she was 70 years old and I just knew she was there and fine and happy. It's not good. That's not a good thing to do, but she's finally getting her own place. And I am so extremely proud of her because she's bright and caring and wonderful. It's just sometimes when those traumas happen, they they struggle socially. They almost stop in that place. And those traumas can really keep them there. And they do not grow at the same rate and mature at the same rate as kids their normal age. So it takes them a while, but she's finally there. So um, I am, I can say now that she is in a good place and, but it took a long time from 10 and a half to about 21 years old. It took for her to figure out who she was which is rough. Any other questions? Anybody else want to unmute? 
Uh, yeah, I actually have a comment when you mentioned trauma. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, EMDR, which is eye movement reprocessing desensitization therapy, you might probably are familiar with it, but that can be very helpful for people for, for unlocking and reprocessing those kinds of events and moving past them. No, absolutely. Um, she now, she's doing really good, but I think because I pushed therapy so much in the beginning she went through this phase of do not talk to me about another counselor mom do not talk to me because they're not going to fix it and make it perfect I'm like you're right they're not they're not but they're going to listen and there are support so believe me I talked to her about you know cognitive behavioral I talked to her about dialectical behavior I talked to her about EMDR I talked to her about all of it and um I think she will eventually need it again. Honestly, I do. I think once she moves out, there may be that other phase that she might go through. So um, yes, I appreciate that. But if listen, if I could give you her phone number and you could call her and tell her, I would be thrilled. I'd offer any of you her number if you could get her to go. I'd be great. But sometimes it's when they're adults, it's hard to force them anymore. You can't, you can't make them go. Well, I'm familiar with it and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else before we let Tina go? Tina, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you so much for making time for us today and, and for sharing your story and sharing your thoughts. Um, it was very moving and very, I'm sure, beneficial to this group of oh, thank leaders. You. So I just can't thank you enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, please don't ever hesitate if you need to reach out and need any supports. But thank you all so much. All righty. Moving on to our second speaker of today. Our second speaker is Carrie Portell. After surviving being hit by an impaired driver, Carrie has learned to thrive despite the pain and disabilities of this car crash has caused her. Her ability to recognize that every day her choice in attitude will depict whether she succeeds or fails has taught her to wake has taught her to wake up each day and ask the question, what choice will you make? Carrie is the author of a brand new book called Facing Life Head On, and I'm sure she's going to tell us more about that. Um, it's my honor to introduce to you Mrs. Carrie Portell. Carrie, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Skip. So I am I am not in St. Charles. I am down I-44 west of you guys in St. James. So I think St. Charles is maybe an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. And uh, Skip and I are actually old high school classmates. And I was uh, very excited when he called and asked if I could help out with your monthly meeting because uh, speaking events are so rare the past year that I, if I can do anything right now, um, I accept immediately. And um, so as he said, I was, in, I was hit by an impaired driver. Um, I was not by myself. Actually, I had two of my children with me. We have four and it was our two middle children. And it was 10 years ago this past December. And I tell everybody our car crash happened just like it does in the movies. Uh, that stuff has to come from somewhere. And now I know that a lot of it that they show us is real. So one second, the girls and I were giggling. And the next second, I looked back at the road in front of me and I said, this is going to happen. And I knew in my heart it was going to be bad. And at the very last second, I accepted that I was probably not going to make it, but I, I did beg God to please save my girls. So I, I do not remember it, but there were four vehicles involved in our crash. I thought it was just the impaired driver and I, and we were not the first ones in line. We were actually the second one, but the impact was mainly between him and I, and it has left me with 
disabling injuries. Um, technically I am disabled. I, I never tell people that I, I feel like I'm a partially disabled person. I can still do things, but I am a part-time wheelchair user moving more towards full-time. I can take around 1700 steps a day. And the reason for that is my three worst injuries were my pelvis and both of my lower legs and ankles. So my lower legs and ankles were crushed and I've had 10 surgeries on them, five on each side. And then I've had three on my pelvis, basically just to try to keep them together to the point where I can walk, but it just becomes too painful to be able to use them at a certain point. So I have to limit myself every day. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I have to decide what is my priority for using my steps how can I save steps and energy? So it's a, it's a thought process every single day whenever I give up. But out of those uh, four vehicles, that impaired driver was the only one who was not wearing his seatbelt that night, and he died on impact. He, he was partially ejected. Uh, his blood alcohol level was 0.265. So that you guys know that's at this point three and a half times the legal limit. And he was a repeat offender. I believe they told me that this, this would, was his fifth offense. And why he still had his license, nobody knew. They couldn't, you know, tell me why. But, you know, our, our judicial system didn't um, put the hammer to him and, and stop him before this. And unfortunately for him, this, this was his last one. And he paid the ultimate price for that. Moving on from that, um, I am the one who has to live with the consequences of his choice. And my biggest struggle every day is pain. I have severe bone damage, which causes pain every day, but I also have nerve damage that is just, it just cannot be controlled. We're trying so hard to control it. And between those two, it is, it can be all encompassing. And when Skip asked me, you know, how, how do you think you could prepare for something like this? It, it was kind of like Tina, it's, it's hard to, to say that, um, you know, how to prepare for a tragedy that, you know, of this magnitude. But when I really thought about it, um, one thing that really helped me prepare for like the initial part of I would say more my extrication because it, it did take an hour to be able to get me out of that car. And I am also very fortunate that I used to work in healthcare. I was an x-ray and an MRI tech, and I took care of patients that were just like me. And I knew that I needed to behave a certain way while they were caring for me so that they could get their job done because that's what I needed for my patients to do. And I know it's hard to, you know, when you're in a situation like that and things are just so chaotic and going crazy and you don't really know how you're going to react, but I'm a pretty subdued person anyway, very low key. And in my mind, I remembered being very low key during my extrication. I remember that, um, telling myself, you know, Carrie, you just need to stay calm and do exactly what they tell you to do because, they need to be able to get you out of here, hopefully in one piece. And there is a video that the fire chief had of that night. He was wearing a helmet camera and uh, it's a, an hour long because that's how long it took to get me out of there. And it, it's hard for me sometimes to trust my memories because they it's almost like I am pulling movie clips out. I, I don't have the whole movie. I just have clips from it. But watching that video, it, it was true. I, I was very calm. Um, I didn't speak the entire time except to answer yes or no. The only time I said anything was when they were pulling my right leg out, which had a huge open fracture. And, you know, it was just basically involuntary. I, it hurt. And um, the other thing that I really remember, and when I talk to emergency crews, I, I really want to reiterate uh, how fantastic 
they reacted during my extrication. I remember their voice being very firm and I knew that they needed to say it firmly to me to get it through my fog so that I would understand what they needed me to do was very important. But yet I could hear the compassion in their voice that, Carrie, we're going to get you out of here. It, you know, everything's going to be okay. I need you to do this for me. And never once do I remember any kind of, you know, like disgruntled conversation between any of the emergency crew. And, and that was backed up by that video. They, they always work together. Um, nobody was derogatory towards anyone else. And it's very important to the victim, the patient during that time for that emergency crew to be like that, because you may think, you know, they're not going to remember anything, but the oddest moments have stayed with me. And I'm thinking, why did that memory stay and not something way more important um, or emotional than that one? And that is one of the things that I can remember is that I, I am so grateful for that emergency crew for um, having the, the behavior and reaction that they did. And um, you guys, you know, the emergency crew never gets the thank you that they deserve. Um, most of the time, whenever you guys leave the scene of, a, of an accident or, or something like that, it's that that's the last that you interact with that with that patient. And the, my community is very small. So I knew nearly everyone who was on the scene that night. And in the last 10 years, I have also gotten to continue that interaction with them. So for them, it's very difficult because they actually continue to see that person. Um, also with us living right along I-44, most of the time the, the accidents are of, you know, people just traveling through. It's not anybody local. And the night of our crash, all four vehicles were filled with local community members. So I, I know many of them told me, you know, every time they opened up the door, they were like, oh my gosh, it's so-and-so, you know, and, and, oh, then there's, you know, Carrie's kids in there. And the other thing that I can really think about that would prepare me for something like this was if you ever find yourself in a situation where you are being challenged, you know, to the point that you never thought that you would be challenged like this or, or be able to live through something like this is I went through my past challenges. Um, I had a difficult childhood with my parents and I learned to take the positive lessons from that and move forward. I had went through a very difficult divorce and, and at that, you know, each of those times, that was the worst thing that had ever happened to me up until that point. And I didn't know how I was going to be able to get through that. And I did. And so when I was in my recovery, which took a total of four years, and that's a very long time to do nothing except have surgery after surgery and heal. I would look at those past situations and I'm like, man, Carrie, you never thought that you were going to make it through this. And, and that was the worst time of your life up until this point, but you did make it through. And I would go through those situations and look at, look at all those positive lessons that I could learn from. And then I would apply them to my situation that I was going through at that point in time saying, okay, this is what you did then. We're going to have to tweak it a little because this situation is a little different and it's much worse than that. And this is how we're going to get through it. So it was a lot of trial and error and um, some things worked, some things didn't. And just trying to find the motivation, I guess, every single day and figure out why my reason to continue fighting was worth it, uh, was some days a struggle. My biggest question during my recovery was, am I going to walk again? So that was my very first question. And the surgeons couldn't tell me, you know, yeah, Carrie, it's guaranteed you're going to be able to walk again. They always said, you know, if you do get to walk, we're not exactly sure how well 
And we're really not sure how long that's going to last. So my initial prognosis was, okay, now that you're able to walk, maybe you're going to have eight to 10 years of walking part-time before you do end up in a full-time wheelchair. And that has essentially become true. So I'm pretty close to being full-time wheelchair, but uh, I have done everything that they possibly have, or I've done everything that I possibly can. And I follow everything that my surgeons tell me to do to prolong that. And it's here anyway, you know, I've done everything that I can. They've done everything surgery wise that they can, but it's, it's just going to happen. I'm going to have to deal with it. And in knowing that it's not the end of the world, um, I will still be able to function but I do know that I will lose a little bit of my independence. There, there are places now that I can't go, and there are going to be more places that I can't go once I am in a, a full-time wheelchair just because of that accessibility. And Skip knows I am. Um, I was always a very active person. I was very involved in athletics. Uh, my life was very fast-paced, and to come to a complete halt was probably the biggest struggle mentally for me. And the problem with that is my mind was still active. It still said I could do all these things, but my body just won't cooperate anymore. And everybody talks about, you know, the physical struggles because, you know, it's something that you can see. They can see, you know, cast after cast on my legs. They can see the scars that I have. They can see when I'm in pain. But I'm here to tell you that that the emotional and the mental struggle, that pain was every bit as difficult to get through as that physical pain. And sometimes I think even harder. And it's, um, it's all up here. You know, it's, well, just tell yourself, you know, you know that you're going to be okay, Carrie, but it's not as simple as that. And going through chronic pain, it's it's this roller coaster of I feel okay, I don't. And then your emotions follow that roller coaster. And then, you know, when you're down and you try that self-talk, it doesn't always work. And it's so easy to talk to yourself in a negative way. I mean, you can put yourself down in the dumps very quickly. It's much more difficult to have positive self-talk and bring yourself out of those trenches. And at this point, and I, I don't have as much trouble as I did those first four years, um, but there are times when, when my pain just will not let up, that like there's everything that I do just will not ease it, where I start to get a little weepy. And I start to get down and I, and, you know, you start to have these thoughts of how long can a body continue to fight like this? You know, how long can a body continue to feel this amount of pain and not give up? And it's, it's difficult to understand that you, you have to be your own best coach. You have to be your own best motivator. And I am lucky in the fact that I, I do have a partner, a husband that can be my coach and he accepts that responsibility. He is someone who can understand that what I need is not to be coddled and that giving me a bunch of sympathy is not going to help my situation. Um, not enabling someone to continue in in their depression or, you know, their distress at the time, that's a tough job for a person because they're going to have to stand up to you in those moments and say, I know what your situation is. I know what you're going through. I'm right here with you, but you're going to have to suck it up today because you're still a parent. You're still a wife and you've got stuff to do. And fortunately, like my my mind um, says those things anyway, but he is there to mimic them and, and just reiterate to me in those moments what my mind is already telling me. And sometimes I just need somebody else to, to say it. And he has been, been the best at that. I mean, I, I feel like his calling is that he could be a life coach. And 
he's like hell to the no, I'm not dealing with anybody else but you. So, <laughs> you know, you're enough. But um, Skip will tell you when we were in high school, I am the very last person you would ever expect to be a public speaker because I am a naturally introverted person. I was very shy in school. Um, I mean, even, even up to the age of 35, when I had my car crash, it's, I forced myself to do okay in public and social situations, but as soon as I could get out of it, I mean, I was gone. I was out of there and it was the whole, I would get the, the red hives, you know, all over me and I would sweat and it was just not a great sight. And I have had to force myself to grow. And I can tell you that, uh, if you will not ignore your situation, ignore your struggle or challenge and take a deep breath, knowing that it's going to be very difficult to work through it, but doing it anyway, that is the best advice I could ever give anyone to, to tell them that was more of a preparation um, tactic to, hey, I know at some point in my life, something really bad is going to happen to me. And if I can just make a commitment to do the work and get through it, I know that I will come out on the other side, maybe not unscathed, maybe not the same person as I was before, but I will come out on the other side and I can look them back and I can say, holy heck, man, that was rough. That was really rough, but I made it and I'm here and I did it. And I, I would say that would be my, my number one goal to anyone is saying, just put your head down and do the work and, and you can get through it. Use the support that you have around you. And every single day is not going to be good. But if you wake up and you say, okay, today I'm going to have to consciously choose my attitude that will be able to get you through anything in life. But you have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to ask someone for help. You have to be willing to say to yourself, Carrie, you're not acting like a very good person today. You need to change your attitude. And I, I have to do that many days because the first thing when I wake up in the morning and my eyelids flip open, I feel pain. And the last thing that I feel before my eyelids close at night is pain. And it, it could be very easy to become a person just filled with angst. And you guys know when you have a really bad day that everything just seems to go wrong, doesn't it? I mean, just it just seems to snowball, like nothing's going right. Everybody's in a bad mood. And, you know, it just, you, you feel exhausted because because you expend so much energy and, you can turn that around and some days you might say, you know what, I'm not very good to be around. So I'm just going to like limit my interaction with people for their benefit and mine. But getting through those rough days, um, sometimes rough weeks, rough years, you know, we can say 2020 has been a rough year. It's not been the greatest. You look back and you can always say, this is what I did. I, great, I chose a good attitude most days. I use the support around you and I decided to work through it instead of just ignoring it and going around it. And here we are, we made it through. So I probably was a little short on that. Um, I didn't really explain a lot of my car crash, but if you guys have any questions about it, I, I would definitely be able to answer them. I was gonna show a couple pictures just so you could, guys could get the, the gist of how severe it was, but then I just, decided to talk instead. So Carrie, I was getting a little emotional as you were going through this. is the first time I've heard Carrie actually tell her story and just being friends with her and knowing her. It's like, oh, it's time. Um, I always do. Like my throat hurts right now because I always get that, that thickness in there. And uh, I feel like I sometimes start like talking like a man, like my voice gets deep. <laughs> So does anybody want to unmute and ask a question of Carrie? 
how are your girls doing? Were they? I was just going to say that if nobody was going to talk, I was like, that's usually the first question that comes up because um, I forget to say that I get off and I forget to say how they turned out. But um, they they had moderate injuries. They were able to heal in about six weeks. Uh, my daughter in the front seat, uh, she had a pretty deep uh, seat belt laceration into her abdomen. And fortunately, the, the CT showed that it didn't go all the way through, you know, so she didn't have like any internal organ damage or anything. But um, I always tell everybody it was uh, like to give you an idea of how hard we were hit. It was zero degrees that day. And she told me later that she was so cold that she had on two pairs of sweats. And then she had one of those. She was 10. So she had on one of those really thick puffy kid coats and that seatbelt was still able to lacerate that deep into her abdomen. And my daughter in the back seat, um, she had some glass lacerations, but the biggest thing was uh, she broke her arm. And the reason she broke her arm, um, I, I was just ending my photography career at that point and going back into the healthcare field. And that morning I laid my studio camera in the back seat and I didn't put it in a case, didn't think anything about it. So um, we were lucky that when we were hit, we twirled on, on the road, but that camera catapulted off our back seat and hit her in the arm. And they said, that's what actually broke her arm. So we were very fortunate that we didn't roll because at any point, you know, that camera becomes a weapon that's rolling around inside of our car and it, it could have hit any one of us in the head and then yeah, we may have survived the actual impact, but then that camera could have taken our lives, you know, something so stupid that now I'm, I'm always looking in my back seat, or, you know, when the kids got to the point where they were start driving, I would look in their back seat and instead of putting their, their books in their backpack, I, I mean, have you guys ever seen the history or geometry books? They're this thick. And I was like, kids, I know it's like a book, but can you imagine that sucker coming off the back seat and whacking you in the back of the head, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So when I talk to teens, I always tell them, you know, I challenge you when you leave today to go out to your car and look what's in your back seat and see if there's something big enough in there that could actually take your life. But I did forget to tell you that he was, um, when we did hit head on, he, he had been slowed by the truck in front of us. He had kind of skidded down the truck in a, in a trailer in front of us and it slowed him to somewhere in excess of 85 miles an hour when we hit head on. And the reason that I do have so much damage is we hit head on, but it was more on the, on the driver's side. And because we hit at that awkward angle, it, it turned him to have a second impact into the side of my door. So I had the initial head on impact, but then he, also then crushed in the, the side of my door. So um, they said the impact like of the, like the floorboard coming up and hitting my feet crushed my ankles one way. And then whenever he came in, it scooted me to my console and that's what crushed him the other way and then broke my pelvis as well. So, and I think Tina had or somebody had said, maybe it was Mark, that um, it's guaranteed that you will have one huge challenge in your life. Well, it's guaranteed that you will be in one car crash in your life. And I, you guys, this is it. I'd never even been in a fender bender before this happened. And boy, did I do it upright. Anybody else with a question? There are some uh, comments for you, Carrie, in the chat box. Carrie, oh, yes, I see them. Oh, yeah. God is um, definitely using me. I, I feel that, um, you know, God gives us all choices and he tries to change our choice. But that night he couldn't change this man's joy choice to get behind the wheel. And it's like he kind of put his arms around us and buffered as much as he could. And he has definitely guided through this experience. Um, you know, he's guided me a lot. I have a great relationship with him now. Um, I kid when I give my faith-based presentation, I say I have my relationship with God is exactly like my relationship with my husband. It's very sarcastic and humorous. And um, I think he enjoys that with me. He knows he's always going to win. So he, I mean, he lets me banter as much as I want to, but he knows that he's, he's going to win. But um, 
Yeah, I have spoken for MAD once in Jeff City. Um, I, I went to an offenders program. It was my first time ever speaking at an offenders class. And boy, was I nervous because I was thinking they're not going to want to hear what I have to say. But um, by the end of it, I it, it was a challenge to me because there were there were two that were not wanting to pay attention. And by the end of it, I had them and I was like, oh, I got them. I'm like, they're paying attention now. So um, I will share just last weekend, I finally wrote my book, or I guess I launched it last weekend, but I had been pushed and pushed by my community um, to write a book about everything that had happened. And I, the book is only about my first year of recovery because that once I got through that first year, I'm like, man, I just, I'm exhausted. It is so hard to go back and dig up all of these memories and these feelings. And um, I just had someone give me the best idea. He said, Carrie, I want to buy enough books to give to our entire driver's ed program. Um, and I thought, holy cow, why have I not thought about that? That's the perfect book to force a student to read for a grade. <laughs> and um, so he's going to purchase them for uh, his driver's ed program. So I think I, that's going to be on my agenda, um, you know, if schools even have driver's ed programs. I know a lot of them don't anymore, but I think that would be a great, um, great thing to have the kids do you know, they watch the movies and all that kind of stuff, but to, to read about somebody in real life, I think that would, that would be pretty beneficial to them. And Carrie, correct me if I'm wrong, but your most common audience and who you have the most passion speaking to is kids, high school kids. And it seems yeah. Cool. Yeah. That has definitely been my, my number one um, request. And uh, I, I, I think I do well with the kids because um, my kids are that age right now. And I can, I can understand, I guess, more importantly, how to talk to them. Um, I do not put a bunch of st statistics in my presentation because I feel like they just, you know, it just goes right past them. Uh, so I tell more of the emotional side of, of how someone else's choice has now affected me and how I have to live with it. And I also knew from raising my own kids that, if I tell them you need to do this or you need to do that, immediately they're going to put up this buffer and they're going to go, you're not going to tell me what to do, lady. So I end every presentation with what choice will you make? And that way it's in their lap, it's in their court, and they have to know that they're making the choice to do whatever, you know, to drive or not to drive distracted. Carrie, we thank you so much. It's so great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed being here and I appreciate you guys welcoming me. We're going to share out um, on the email how to get your book and all of and Carrie's all over social media. She's a blogger. She's um, spreading inspiration on almost on a daily basis. So we're going to get all that information out to everybody. Thank you so much, Carrie. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. All right. We have one more guest speaker today. And that guest speaker is Amy Shaw. Amy became the president and CEO of Nine PBS in February of last year. She's the first woman to lead Nine in its 65 year history. Ms. Shaw is recognized as a national leader and innovator in community engagement and public media. She leads a talented team in groundbreaking work that leverages on-air, online, and community engagement for measurable impact around important and complex issues facing communities. It is my pleasure and our honor to welcome Amy Shaw to our leadership call today. Amy, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, how many of you have watched PBS before? Nine PBS, Channel 9. Yay! So uh, what do you watch? Is it something you grew up with or are you watching something now? I'm not watching anything now, but we like the documentaries when they have them on there. That's great. Yeah, that's what I watch too. That's my background actually in documentary production. So I've, I came up through the production path. So thanks. What else do people watch or your kids watch? 
concerts, documentaries, thank you. Okay, so we're your PBS station and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, um, the last two years have been really interesting and uh, I'm gonna share with you some of those stories. Some of this is professional, more professional crisis, a little bit of personal crisis as well. And Skip, I just have a few little slides. Um, so if you don't mind being the driver, I'd really appreciate that. You want me to go and share those now? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I'll tell you when to advance. Again, I just have like four slides, folks. So I promise you won't have to read or, you know, it's very simple. Um, so there has just been so much change over this last year. I think we can all agree, like who would have imagined a year ago where we were and now to be in such a different and hopeful time. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time at 9PBS thinking about how we can prepare for a crisis. Even before the pandemic, we've had a lot of experience with crises and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. First, let me tell you about 9PBS. Most of you have known us as KETC Channel 9. Uh, we're your local PBS station and um, we're a really special place. We're kind of small and scrappy, but we're really well known among the 150 public television stations across the country where um, we're a very special place. So um, we're the 23rd media market in the country, which means there's 22 bigger markets than us and about 200 plus markets that are smaller than us. So we are a sizable market. And in calendar 2020, nine PBS ranked number one among all public television stations in the country, we were actually um, number one. More people watch PBS in St. Louis than watched any other public television station across the country in, in terms of the highest percentage of households watching us. So thank you, thanks for watching. We really appreciate that. Um, it's a great thing. It's just one aspect of our service. We're, we're very focused on Broadcast online in the community, we're very well known for our community engagement work. The majority of public television stations across the country um, follow our model of how to engage the community. And, and well before and amid this pandemic, we've distinguished ourselves as an essential and relevant community institution. And um, I hope again that you keep watching PBS, 9 PBS, um, but beyond the programming, community is really at the heart of our work. And, it's actually one of the most revolutionary ideas about our founding, it, highly unlikely that a public television station would even get on the air back in 1954. But we were the first station in the country to be licensed to a local community. A lot of public television stations are licensed to universities or school systems. We're licensed to you. So we're your PBS station. Again, we rebranded in January, this January to nine PBS. To be clear about who we are, we've been Nine Network of Public Media the last 10 years and before that KETC Channel 9. If you'll go to the next slide, Mark, um, this will look very familiar. These are some of our team members. We have about 60 full-time people and about 100 part-time people, videographers, editors, um, but the majority of our, our 60, we do all kinds of different things. Um, you know, there's been a ton of positives from working at home this last year. We went remote on uh, March 19th. That was the last day we ordered everybody out of the building. We have a, a skeleton crew that works inside the station. I'm working from home right now. My dog will probably bark at some point um, in the middle of this as most of that happens for us. Um, it, a lot of positives, a lot of good things have come from this year. And so personally speaking, I used to travel a ton at least once a week, once every two weeks. And so I'm not as exhausted from that. And nonstop events, I, I have actually eaten dinner with my husband more this last year than I think I probably have in our entire 25 years of marriage combined, which is a very good thing, by the way, to test that and realize you really like the person you married. Uh, by the way, I was married in St. Charles. My brother's best friend uh, was a minister. My husband and I were not living in St. Louis at the time. We're both from, I'm from here, he's not. And uh, we came back and got married in St. Charles and had our wedding reception there. It was a great experience. Um, as Skip mentioned, I became the, the president and CEO of 9PBS in February of 2020, just as the pandemic was emerging to be like this thing that we were all hearing about, but not really sure how it was going to affect us. 
I am very proud to be the first woman to hold this role in our 67 year history. I've actually been at um, 9PBS since 2003 and before that I worked for five years at another public television station in Carbondale, Illinois, where I met my husband and I did my master's work. Um, so this is where the story starts to, to come together. So at the end of January, 2020, uh, 2019, um, sorry, I'm getting my years mixed up. End of January, 2020, one week before I officially became our CEO, I was at a conference in Washington, DC. And this is the part where like crisis can enter our, each of our individual lives at any moment. You never know when things are gonna change. Like it doesn't take much. And so I was hustling at a conference to get from one thing to the next. And I was talking to somebody and Clifford, the big red dog, you know, the big costume character was right behind me. And I was talking to him and I was kind of looking over my shoulder. And I tripped over a threshold between two flooring surfaces. And I, um, I broke my shoulder in eight places. You know, like not at all what I planned to be doing that day. So I got the big ambulance ride through Washington, DC to the same hospital where Ronald Reagan was taken after he was nearly assassinated. Um, you know, it just was not what I wanted to be doing. And I had a little nervous breakdown actually on the uh, x-ray table because the this was just not the way that I wanted things to go. I was um, pretty sure that I was gonna be named our CEO. And so those first couple of weeks new in this job were incredibly challenging. I was in just so much physical pain. There was a pandemic bearing down on us and just, it was such uncertainty. It just was not at all how I um, had planned on starting this grand new role. Um, and, you know, we were figuring out this new world of remote work and how to support learners in our community and how all of us were going to adapt to this pandemic. My mother was also in the process of dying and I'm, um, you know, I'm the get it done person. So I was trying to juggle all these different things. And so, and part of the thing that was really in my head was that personally 2020 was supposed to be like an amazing year. And that's because 2019 had been this incredibly challenging year. Um, it had been a traumatic and, and life-changing year, to be honest. So, um, so if you'll go to the next slide, Skip. So when I was, I became the official CEO of 9PBS in February of 2020, um, broken shoulder and all, but I had been the interim CEO uh, since April 16th, 2019. And that's because the guy that I'm standing next to there, who was our CEO, Jack Galmish, who was a great champion for me. He was my mentor. He was my boss. I was his right hand. Um, he died. Um, he didn't come to work that day. Um, and it was a very, you know, the day started off like any other. I was super busy and I was stressed and I had all kinds of things to get done. I'd been out of town. I came back in town and you know, the day went along and I actually was supposed to have a one o'clock meeting with him and his assistant texted me to say, you know, I'm becoming very concerned because I just haven't heard from Jack today, which is very unusual because Jack was like 24 seven texting, emailing, you know, your, your life was work. And I had become very accustomed to that. And, and I just thought, oh gosh, he's, you know, he got stuck in a meeting or he's doing, she said, no, I, I can't find any emails that he sent since like nine o'clock last night. He's not answering his phone. And so as the, as the minutes go by, we send our chief engineer over to his house and uh, he had passed away in his sleep. He just had, he had just left us. And it was so shocking personally, but it was so professionally shocking to realize what we were gonna to need to do for our staff and how we were gonna to need to take care of our staff because almost immediately people were afraid they were gonna lose their jobs. What did this mean for them? And just, you know, we're a company. We had all these things that were happening. And so it was very strange to be part of the discovery process. Um, in the small world of St. Louis, it, his wife, I've known the family for a long time. His wife was my geometry teacher in high school. So it's like this very weird interconnected thing. And, but what became very clear for me is that the person that I had gone, that I was when I went to work that, that morning was rewired. And I, was, I walked out of the building very, very, very late that night as a very different person having to call 
colleagues from across the country, the president of PBS, the president of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and share this really awful news. Um, Jack was 71, but he was, you know, like a soccer player. He was fit, he was healthy. Um, and I just, I knew that personally I was gonna have to draw really deep from within to be the person that people needed me to be as the leader, because again, I immediately, the board named me the interim CEO, which became like, oh my gosh, what am I, there's so much to do, what do we do? Um, I'll also mention that the very next day, my, um, my in-law's house burned to the ground in an electrical fire four hours away from us. And so my husband and I just looked at each other at you know 5.30 that morning when all of this, his parents' house burned down and just said like, we're gonna have to be really careful because the world is very strange around us and we're in danger of doing something stupid that could hurt us or others. Like, let's just take a deep breath. We're gonna do this. Um, so I spent nine months as the interim CEO and I was simultaneously in a very public and practical job interview as our board did the national search. Um, the FCC requires you to do a, a search. So we scoured the country. And so that was um, scary and interesting all at the same time, but I think what has become very clear is that over the last two years, um, I think in a crisis, you become more of who you really are. And so if you're a strong person, I think you're, and you've heard it from the, you know, Tina and, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, our previous speaker, uh, Carrie, thank you. Um, it's, it's just this really interesting thing of, you become more of who you really are. And if you're really strong, you just get stronger. And, you are more vulnerable and people take care of you and things, things evolve. So it, it also um, reminds me that I think in difficult times, you really need to lock arms with the people that you trust, which means that you have to develop trust and relationships long before there's a crisis. And I think that's one of the most critical aspects of preparation and that's what we've all had to do in this pandemic is trust people. And it brings me to a thought there's a, I'm really hooked on the revisionist history podcast by Malcolm Gladwell. And in season four, there's um, an episode titled the obscure virus club, which we all know a lot more about viruses than we used to, but it's about people who've done groundbreaking work in their field. And so groundbreaking in fact, that oftentimes they were discounted or shunned by their peers. And um, so if you'll go to the next slide, Skip, it's that, um, according to Gladwell, in the end, it's who we are in challenging times comes down to how we act under novel and difficult circumstances. And I think, as Skip said, sometimes you're in personal crisis, sometimes you're in professional crisis, sometimes those two things collide. Um, leadership really matters in a crisis. And I think also communication matters. For us, it's been ensuring that our staff and our communities are really taken care of whether it being from our CEO dying or whether it be from um, the pandemic and taking care of people. Like I said, I, I really do believe who you really are is shows up big time in a crisis. And that's why we have to be the kind of people that lock arms with the people we trust. And I think it's the investment in people and re relationships that make us better prepared for these crises. So some of the things that we've learned in our work is flexibility has been really key. And for us, it's been taking care of our staff, making sure that in good times and in bad, we take care of them and that we develop that kind of trust and so that each of us has more reserves to respond in those good times and bad, um, constantly recalibrating our work and re recalibrating how we're doing things, how we're talking about things, how we're taking care of each other. Are we doing okay? What it, what changes in our policies do we need to make? We've made huge policy changes at nine. We've all been working remotely. We're probably gonna stay working remotely through most of um, the summer, go back to the office in likely September. Um, and then also big flexibility. We're gonna work summer work hours this summer, meaning that you can work your 40 hours in any way that you want, but we're taking Friday afternoons off. Um, We've asked people to be more vulnerable, um, like tell us what you need, share what you need. I've had to be more vulnerable. The broken shoulder kind of ensured that one because um, I actually have not seen any of our staff since I 
did not have a broken shoulder. The beauty is I got to do 100 hours of physical therapy without worrying about going into the office every day. And so there's like some silver linings there. Um, how to embrace love and joy in our work and that we're really privileged to be able to have jobs in this environment and that we're privileged to be able to do this kind of work that serves community. Um, and the interesting thing is that in our work, we've actually been more successful in all of this. As I said, we're the number one rated public television station in the country. Our resources are good. Like our, by every metric we have improved over this last year and really over these last two years. And I think that's an investment in our staff. And I think a crisis really helps people come together and think about what's so important to ourselves. And so we've been able to embrace people as our staff as humans, not just as staffers. Um, I, I think at 9PBS, had we not been in the crisis in 2019, I think 2020 would have actually been more difficult. And I think in inadvertently, we had planned for crises in ways that we didn't know, but 2019 certainly set us up. Um, also, had we not trusted each other and built that trust and continue to invest in that trust and in those relationships, I think our outcomes would have been vastly different. Um, we've remade our organization. We're always a work in progress, but we're more ready and more resilient to address the next small or giant crisis, whether that be a personal crisis or a professional crisis. As I said, the outcomes of our work have been extraordinary in 2020 and now in 2021. And it's who we've been in this crisis, I think, that's going to determine who we are in the years to come. My dog's going to bark. Um, and again, remember, it's how we act under novel and difficult circumstances. There's no savior coming for any of us. It's really in the talents and the assets and the capabilities of all of us working together. And we each need each other now more than ever. So I'll share my contact information, Skip, and happy to take any questions. Um, I really appreciate your time today. I, I was part of Leadership St. Louis, um, and I'm actually on the selection committee for the next class of Leadership St. Louis. But uh, I think these kinds of organizations are really important. So thanks for your time. Questions for Amy. Hey, Amy, this is Jason Galvin. I have a question for you. What, what is one thing that you learned um, in this crisis that you didn't even know that you needed to learn uh, to be able to lead your team through this tragedy? or this event? Um, how much people want you as the leader of the organization to be a human being, um, which was not, I mean, I, I've, again, I've worked with a lot of our staff for a long time. And so that wasn't super surprising, but the ability to be vulnerable and be human and say what you don't know and say what your concerns are and say what you're scared about was very freeing for me personally, but was also uh, very, uh, I think it was a relief for our staff because they were also in that same place. I mean, you have, you have to assure people that things are gonna be okay, which we certainly did. But I think just being able to be yourself and really bring your full self to your work and for your full self to a crisis the, um, the day after Jack had passed away, um, I, we called an all staff meeting the next day. And, you know, we called it, actually, we, we alert, we told the staff that afternoon, which was very scary. And then the next day we did, we catered in a lunch. We just wanted to get everybody together. So we catered in a lunch. And I remember telling my husband, who's a big boy scout, and he's always sort of has the right motivational thing to talk about at any given time, I, I had come home so late that night and said like, I need something to talk about. And so I, um, like I need something motivating. And so he gave me this great poem and it's basically about a church in Cambridge that burns to the ground. It was built in the 1300s, it burns, a true story basically burns to the ground. And the leaders are saying, how are we gonna rebuild this? And they say, well, thankfully, the people who built this church, our founders, had the forethought to plant oak trees all across this grove. They actually thought about this. So they planted seeds for what the future would be. And so like, as I'm trying to read this poem, which is quite profound, I'm not doing it justice, I am sobbing hysterically because I had not, you know, I, I spent the last 24 hours 
calling people, figuring, you know, like all the logistics, I hadn't really processed the grief personally. And so, and I felt terrible about like breaking down and people were like, that was very um, refreshing because we actually needed you to be human at that point and not be the leader. And so I think just the ability to be yourself and how much people appreciate that versus being some sort of caricature of what the CEO is supposed to be. Thank you. Any other questions? That is such powerful stuff. Amy, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an honor. Um, it's been so educational. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you, Amy. Um, <clears throat> before I turn it back over to Mark, I just, I, I'm just kind of in awe of, of our three amazing women speakers today. I just, uh, you know, I had a couple takeaways myself. I hope everybody had some, some takeaways uh, for me. I, I found some commonality between Tina and Carrie's presentations in that when you're not the person, when you're a supporting person, one of the most important things you can do is be present. Tina talked about it with, with those very um, few but very strong friends that she had around. Carrie talked about it with her husband of just, just being there, I think is, you know, I think it is a mercy that has the tagline of the healing power of presence. Um, I think that's, that's one of my takeaways. Um, the other takeaway I had was how do you prepare for a crisis? Well, you really can't, but the best way if you can is to have a crisis, right? Carrie talked about her divorce and her difficult childhood Amy was talking about, you know, the, the, the death of the CEO in 2019 and some of those um, kind of organizational crises that they faced uh, and how that helped prepare them for uh, this crazy 2020. So those are just a couple of my takeaways, but um, I think it's going to take a while for it all to kind of sink in for us. And I'm so happy that this was recorded so it can be shared out. Um, so. Once again, thank you. I know Tina had another commitment, so she had to jump off. That's why we had to move it a little bit earlier today. But thank you so much to Carrie and to Amy. It was phenomenal. Um, Mark, I'm gonna kick it back over to you for some final comments. And I just wanna wish everybody a great day and it's great to see everybody. Thank you, Skip. I appreciate it very much. And uh, um, just like, uh, Skip mentioned one of the things that uh, I kept grabbing from from each of, of our speakers today. And again, I want to sincerely thank uh, Tina, Carrie, and Amy again for for sharing and being open and vulnerable. Uh, is is being able to to depend and lean on so many others that are there to to be able to support, to care, to provide that uh, that that uplift when you need it. And so again, I, I sincerely appreciate uh, all of our speakers today. It's been um, uh, very challenging for me personally. Uh, moving, I'm an emotional guy. I moved to, to being choked up with each one of you guys. And so again, uh, I appreciate that. It means an awful lot. And not only that, but being inspired and, and pushed forward. And again, that means an awful lot. Uh, thank you guys again for your time and your commitment back and spending some time with uh, with our program participants here. Amy, thrilled that you've uh, been a, a participant in, in Leadership St. Louis. We are uh, great partners through uh, an organization called ALP, which is the Association of Leadership Programs across the country. And uh, we have uh, a great opportunity to be able to, to partner again together through that organization and within this community. So again, I appreciate your participation and your, your leadership there. Guys, um, again, thank you so much for, for spending uh, these couple of hours with us today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this kind of wraps up our, our leadership series uh, for this year's program. Um, we will uh, look to do a, a something here over the summer, over these early uh, summer months, to be able to get together again before 
Uh, our um, reception and retreat happens in August. So be sure and keep an eye out for that. We don't want to just all of a sudden not hang out with you guys for a few months and then hang up and, and meet up again in August. So we will be communicating and have something to get together here in uh, these early summer months. So we look forward to that. Thanks again for your participation today, guys. Appreciate it so much. Have a good one. Thank you.